Joe Meek was the first truly independent producer in Britain, and his DIY production techniques were way ahead of their time. Many of his productions, which were all recorded and produced at his apartment above a leather shop, became major hits in the late 50s and early 60s. And Telstar by the Tornadoes went down in history as the first British record to reach number one in both the UK and in the States. But when the Beatles and the Stones and the rest of the British invasion bands appeared on the scene, Meek struggled to adapt to the new times. Most of the records he produced from 1964 until his death in 1967 either failed to chart or stalled at the lower regions of the top 40. But Meek never lost his passion for experimenting and coming up with new sounds, and some of his recordings from that era sound quite ahead of their time and have become cult classics over the years. Let's begin. Baby, some black Of course, no one used the term freak beat in the 60s, but the term perfectly describes that period in British music when bands started moving away from the beat and mod sounds of the mid 60s and started exploring more unconventional and unusual sounds and approaches. Crawdaddy Simone, released in November 1965, is widely considered to be one of the definitive freak beat anthems of the 60s. The song starts off as a fairly conventional bluesy tune. Cheating was his trade. Of lies. But it soon turns into total anarchic and chaotic madness. <laughs> this is probably the noisiest recording of 1965, and it also features the most distorted and craziest guitar solo released that year, courtesy of guitarist Ray Fenning. <laughs> In an interview several years later, the guitarist remembered. But then Joe wanted a solo in the middle that was wild, and I had this de Armand pedal, which was a, a volume tone which features on the crying game, it's that sound, pre-wah-wahs, and he said, no, no, so I went wild, right? And he came back with a beer bottle, and he said, I want you to run this up and down the strings, like, and that became the Freak Beak solo. <laughs> But this wasn't the only single that Meek produced for the group. This single was released a few months before Crawdaddy Simone. At the time, the band still featured future Yes member Steve Howe on guitar. It wouldn't be strange to mistake this single for a new wave recording from the late 70s or early 80s. The keyboards and the unusual drum sound make this sound like the sort of stuff that bands like the B-52s or Devo would record later in the early 80s. Right, None of the Syndicate singles managed to chart, and the group broke up in late 1965. Another highlight from that period was this B-side by the Blue Rondos, released in November 1964. The wild fuzz guitar sounds featured on this song sounded like nothing else from that period. Some sources claim that Jimmy Page played guitar on this track, but the band themselves claim that the guitar was played by their own guitarist Roger Hall. Some of the most way out solos of 1964 were featured on records produced by Joe Meek. This B-side by The Outlaws, also released in 1964, featured an incredible solo by future Deep Purple member Richie Blackmore. Disc jockey John Peel once said that this B-side was the first heavy metal record. And considering that this was recorded at least three years before guitarists like Hendrix appeared on the scene, it definitely sounds way ahead of its time. In an interview from 1983, Richie Blackmore recalled, Joe Meek had said to me, go crazy, play a very weird solo, bend the notes and play with lots of distortion and a very freaky effect. And I went, okay. I was quite proud of that solo at this time, which was 63. And uh, when I met Jeff Beck 
in 67 in the ship in Water Street. He told me how much Hendrix had liked that particular track, so I was very pleased with that as I was a Hendrix fanatic and a Jeff Beck fanatic. Many Meek productions from the early to mid-60s featured the Outlaws as a backing band. Richie Blackmore was a member of the Outlaws from 1962 till early 1965, so his guitar can be heard on many Meek productions from that period. In fact, Blackmore still played on several Meek recordings even after leaving the Outlaws. The guitarist was featured on most recordings by Heinz. This one comes from Heinz, backed by his own group, the Wild Boys, and it's called I'm Not a Bad Guy. A bad guy. Say I go around making girls cry. This single by Heinz, released in November 1966, is yet another example of a great Meek production featuring Richie Blackmore on guitar. Heinz got his start in music playing bass for the Tornadoes. After the success of Telstar, Joe Meek planned to turn him into a solo star. Meek became his manager and spent a lot of money trying to promote him. And Heinz even managed to score one major hit with a song called Just Like Eddie, another tune which featured Blackmore on guitar. Play my guitar just like Eddie. Heinz even had a main role in a film called Live It Up, which featured a young Steve Marriott pretending to be the drummer of his band. But the solo star failed to replicate the success of that single and he quickly faded away from the public eye. By 1966, even though he was just 24 years old, Heinz was already seen as a distant memory from a previous generation. I'm Not a Bad Guy was the B-side of the last single he released with Joe Meek as a producer. The A-side was another good song called Moving In. I'd like to cry, cry tell you, baby, it's sweet, bye -bye. The song featured yet again some great guitar by Blackboard. The single meant nothing in the charts, but this 45 is one of the best recordings that Heinz ever released. I was so you came along. Just like Crawdaddy Simone by The Syndicates, this single by The Buzz, released in April 1966, is also considered to be one of the wildest singles that Joe Meek ever produced. Clearly, the general public wasn't ready for this type of sound in 1966, and the single sank without a trace. You ain't helping me, you're holding me down. But this 45 has become a cult classic, and its appearance on several compilations over the years has turned this single into a really expensive collector's item, exchanging hands on Discogs or eBay for over a thousand pounds. And here's yet another song, which sounded like it could have been recorded by a new wave band from the early 80s. This single by The Riot Squad is yet another example of a meek production that sounded way ahead of its time. Certain parts of the song even seem to predate the sound of bands like Roxy Music by at least six years. Riot Squad got their start in 1963 and went through several lineups over the years. An early lineup of the band featured future Jimi Hendrix drummer Mitch Mitchell. Later in 1967, David Bowie joined the band as their lead vocalist and stayed in the group for about a year. They managed to get some press attention due to their shocking live shows. But none of their singles achieved success in the charts. Oh yeah, you belong. Honey, is this the first record you've made? Yes, it is the first. It must yeah. be exhausting work playing those drums. Not really, no. The only band from that period which managed to score a number one hit with Joe Meek as a producer were the Honeycombs. Have I the Right became a number one hit in early 1964. But the band failed to replicate the success of the single, 
and with bands like The Stones and The Kinks starting to dominate the charts, their music was deemed outdated. But this B-side definitely sounded way ahead of its time. Earlier in the video, we were talking about bands like the B-52s. This song certainly has similarities with a certain song that the B-52s released more than 15 years later. Can't Get Through To You was originally released in July 1965 as the B-side of That's The Way. The single reached number 12 in Britain. Another highlight from that period is this single by David John and the Moon. Digging for Gold is another Meek production which has become a cult freak beat classic over the years. The song was released in July 1965, but it unfortunately failed to chart. Another cool track by the band was this tune called I Love To See You Strut. Love to see you strut Like a proud hand Think about your feathers Blowing in the wind Woo! The song originally appeared as the B-side of Bring It To Jerome, a cover of the classic by Bo Diddley. I said bring it all home Bring it to Jerome the rhythm backing was created with the help of Joe Meek's inventive recording tricks. In an interview several years later, lead singer David John recalled, We felt we needed something different to add to the song. So I went to the toilet and dismantled the metal chain. When I got back to the studio, Joe's eyes lit up, and he immediately left the room and returned with an old biscuit tin. We dropped the chain into the tin on the beat, and Joe layered it with echo and mixed it into the recording. It sounded fantastic. David John and The Mood were one of many rhythm and blues groups that were formed in Britain after the success of bands like The Rolling Stones and The Yardbirds. Their first single, a cover of Pretty Thing, even featured Mick Jagger and Keith Richards playing percussion. Oh, <laughs> the band released three singles during their brief existence and broke up in early 1966. Another artist who released a few great singles with Joe Meek as a producer was Jason Eddy. Singing the Blues was one of the weirdest singles he ever released. The song would be a pretty standard rock tune if it wasn't for that unusual staccato guitar which dominates the whole track. Jason Eddy was actually Billy Fury's younger brother. Billy Fury was one of the biggest British stars of the late 50s and early 60s. But despite being backed by the Tornadoes on many occasions, Joe Meek never managed to work with him. Singing the Blues was the second single that Jason Eddy released with Meek as a producer. The first one, released in December 1965, was also an excellent song called Whatcha Gonna Do. I'm gonna cry my eyes out of you I miss you with a passion so bad both of these singles that Jason Eddy released have also become highly valuable collector's items over the years. This time, be different. Please stay. In February 1966, The Crying Shames released an excellent cover of Please Stay. The song featured a gorgeous haunting production by Joe Meek and the fantastic string arrangement by Ivor Raymond. The single even managed to reach number 26 in Britain, but the band went through a few lineup changes and changed their name to Paul and Richie and the Crying Shames. This new incarnation of the group returned to the recording scene with a cover of September in the Rain by Dinah Washington. The song meant nothing in the charts, but the B-side of the single was a great early slice of psychedelia. Come on back, come on back, and I'll be good to you. 
Just like most singles featured in this video, this B-side has appeared on many Psych and Freak Beat compilations. And you won't find an original copy of this 45 for less than £500. Please Stay by the Crying Shames ended up being the last Meek production to reach the charts in Britain. Joe Meek's mental health had been declining at an alarming rate ever since he was arrested in 1963 for persistently importuning for an immoral purpose. Homosexuality was still illegal in Britain, and it wouldn't be decriminalized until 1967, so Joe Meek was constantly being blackmailed by chances who demanded money in return for not going to the police with invented stories. In addition to that, a court case over the authorship of the song Telstar saw all royalties temporarily frozen. Meek got immersed in his work in order to forget about what was going on. So he became addicted to pills and black coffee, and he also started taking LSD. But despite his declining mental health, no one could have predicted that Meek's life would end the way it did. In an interview several years later, Joe Meek's studio assistant Patrick Pink remembered. Two or three minutes later, up come Mrs. Shent, and she just whispered to me, what's going on, you know, what sort of mood is he in today? I said, oh, God, you know, he's in a terrible mood today. Oh, don't worry, she said, I'll sort him out. And she was upstairs, and all of a sudden I could hear, calm down, Joe. Where's the book, he said, Joe said. Um, I want the book. I've always drawn the conclusion it must have been the rent book. Um, because there's been a lot of problems with the uh, the rent being paid and uh, the lease of the building was about to run out. And uh, I, I, I just walked back into the office and I heard the bang. I was just about to run up to, up the stairs and Mrs. Shenton was falling down. And she'd, she, she fell down right to the bottom of the stairs, uh, right into my arms and uh, I was instantly sort of shocked. I didn't know, really didn't know what had happened. Um, uh, then I, I gently uh, sort of pulled her down and I just shouted up, she's dead. Uh, I, I attempted to run up the stairs when I heard the second bang. And uh, I sort of looked over and I could see Joe lying on the floor. The gun beside him. <laughs> 